Okay, welcome everybody. It's a new year and uh, horrible cedar fever. First time I've ever had it in my life, so bear with me if I, I, I sneeze a little. Um, we're going to get right into it. Uh, we've got some new committee members. Uh, Kara Bang, uh, there. You want, could you unmute and introduce yourself maybe just for a second? Hi, my name is Kara Bang. Sorry, I couldn't join you in person. I'm over here in Korea right now. I couldn't catch the flight back back home, so I'm kind of stuck here, but very nice to see see you guys and join the meeting. Thank you, Kara. Good old Southwestern. Yeah, good old Southwestern <laughs> Korea. And we've got an, another new member, Candy. Hi, Candy yep. Lindsay, uh, Gatesville, Texas broker. People have been to Gatesville, you probably know them for them. No, us for the prisons, but luckily I haven't been in one of those yet. <laughs> <laughs> I was telling Byron when I was growing up as a kid in Austin, my parents say, if you don't start acting right, you'll end up in Gatesville. That was my whole life. And I, and I was scared to death. I, I was scared of Gatesville my whole life. So, okay. Um, Vanessa. Housekeeping. Good morning, everybody. Um, we have, as you can see, a virtual presence and a real life presence, which means um, we want to be mindful of a few things. If you are here virtually, you'll want, and I can see you're already doing it, um, you want to be muted unless you are speaking. Um, and if you're a member, you can, of course, feel free to speak up whenever as you would as though you were in the room. There is also a raise hand function. Um, and depending on if you are using the app or the web version, um, your little emoji thing will be either at the bottom <coughs> or the top, but it looks like this. And so you push it and you raise your hand um, and don't forget to unraise your hand. We try to be mindful of um, of the hands. But if for some reason we aren't, just you know, call out to us. Um, and then on this side, I uh, mute your computers if you join the meeting, like I did not. Um, and uh, you, the, the sound picks up really well in here. I will say, like maybe towards the back of the room, speak up a little bit. Um, but you don't need to yell or I mean, unless you're like really passionate, you don't need to <laughs> scream into a mic. It does a pretty good job. Um, and I think that is it for housekeeping. While well, there's coffee and cookies. Cookies. Yeah, cookies. Marvelous. Okay. Advisory committee training. Back to Vanessa. Oh, gosh. Exciting. Okay. Now I got to share my screen. Gosh, Abby. This is my moment. Presenting to you. Look at that, it worked. Okay. Okay. Um, I actually kind of like to stand. Um, and I'll just lean on my chair. Okay, so um, we're doing something new this year. We started it at the workshop with the commissioners. Um, and that was a little bit of my training, or my sort of my training ground on my training. Um, but I want to start doing this annually just as we welcome new members. Uh, and we've had some reappointments too, um, but really to walk through uh, the advisory committee process, who you all are, who the commission is, um, which this is the a phrase the chair uses, which might be a TR phrase, I don't know. Which hat do you wear um, when you are in this room versus the hat that you wear when you are out conducting business um, and things like that. So I will do this. These are just kind of the notes. Also, I'm not good at technology. Um, okay, so uh, I want to walk through first the mission statement of the Real Estate Commission um, as a whole. So TREC exists to safeguard the public interest and to protect consumers of real estate services. So we're a consumer protection agency. Um, and so through education, licensing, and enforcement, those are our sort of our core functions. We have a bunch of other um, groups that support those core functions. But through education, licensing, and enforcement, the agency ensures the availability of qualified and ethical service providers 
and thereby facilitating economic growth and opportunity across Texas, because that's always a part that's important um, with state agencies is that component of economic growth and opportunity across Texas. I think everyone in this room knows that real estate plays a pretty significant role in that throughout the state. So who who is the commission? Um, I know some of y'all you all probably know this, but I want to walk through it just to really dive in a little bit. So we've got nine members um, which are appointed by the governor. We've got six broker members who um, they bring experience in the industries that Trek regulates. So there are requirements associated with becoming a member of the commission. Um, and they have to have been engaged as licensed broker, brokers as their major occupation for the five years preceding appointment. Um, and so they bring that perspective of the industry that is regulated. We've also got three members uh, who represent the public um, and they bring the public consumer perspective side, right? So um, just three members who are there to wear the hat of, hey, I'm a member of the public, I'm not in this industry. Um, what does this mean for me? What does this mean for those of us who utilize these services? Um, what does this look like from a state agency perspective of which my tax dollars go towards, things like that. Um, and you'll see we've got a little bit of a similar, uh, kind of a mini structure, similar structure on this group. Okay, so I mentioned this before, I'm gonna keep saying it forever and ever. Um, the driving force of the commission is consumer protection and all policy making decisions of the commission center on the concepts of consumer protection and then again that facilitating the economic growth and opportunity throughout the state um, and that's you know both of those are sort of the two key hinges we talk about consumer protection a lot um, in this group in particular well in all the advisory committees um, and that that gets into those hats which i'll talk about in just a second so um, the advisory committees are committees of stakeholders. You guys are all stakeholders. Um, that includes our public member, Rick, um, who's a different type of stakeholder. Um, and, and we'll talk about that. But the um, you guys meet to address relevant issues in the real estate industry. And this group has a specific charge, right? We'll get into that in just a minute. Um, but what these committees do, the, the purpose of these meetings um, is to get together to talk and to make recommendations to the full commission. So when you're, you know, after this meeting concludes, um, the chair develops a report and presents that to the full commission. And to the extent the commission has voted um, to make an official recommendation, that recommendation is made to the full commission. The commission looks at it, um, talks about it. Sometimes we workshop it. Sometimes it's talked about right then and there. Sometimes recommendations are given. I'm thinking back to the, um, I think my first ever meeting was the meeting where they first presented the three hours of contracts. Um, and I and literally, you know, I think I'd worked here for two days. Um, <laughs> and and so I remember, get, you know, feedback was given to, um, to see if it could be incorporated into the 15 hours. Um, and so, but, but that recommendation ultimately came from ESAC um, and was the product of a lot of work, a lot of discussion, rolling up of sleeves like you guys do um, here. And you'll be doing it just a little bit when I stop talking. Um, and so that's truly the purpose of, of the advisory committee. Um, you've got folks here from Trek for a few reasons. Um, You've got uh, Abby and me here to keep you legal. Um, no, what we do is we are here, one, for open meetings purposes, which um, you know I think everybody here has done their open meetings training. So um, we just kind of make sure we've got the quorum, we've got the votes. Um, we're making sure that you know we've communicated to you all that we can't have communications amongst the group, no group emails, no walking quorums. So, you know, Byron can't go shopping an official um, opinion on, or even an un unofficial opinion on like, hey, Kalea, what do you think about us making that brokerage course mandatory? Like, what a great idea, I love it. Um, and then, you know, he goes to Cassie, and then he goes to Bill, and then he goes to Ruben, and none of this is in a meeting, and all of a sudden, we're starting to have problems, right? You guys have done that training. So Abby and I are here to talk about that. Um, we are also here, 
uh, to answer any questions you may have. Um, and similar, we've got subject matter experts here. So Jen is probably our, Jen Wheeler, she's our Director of Education and Examinations. Yes, thank you. All right. <laughs> uh, and so she is really your, your subject matter expert here. She knows what is going on. Um, and she can answer questions for you that you may have. She will um, help facilitate some of those conversations and she will weigh in on ideas. And the, the purpose for that is not to, you know, stifle your ideas. It's the same with me. Um, we're not here to bring you down or do anything along those lines, but we are here to provide sort of the, the real world side of how the agency works, what our system limitations are, what we've seen historically in the past, which I think can be really helpful, what we're seeing right now. We're going to talk about some stats later today that we're able to get. So we really want to serve as a resource so that this group can make the recommendations it needs. Um, and from my end, this is what I say. Okay, in, in real life, I'm super fun, trust me. Uh, in work, I am like the worst, okay? I'm always like, well, there's this and there's that, and you're gonna wanna consider this and that. I'm like, that's my actual job. Um, and, and I love it. It's super fun, I love doing this, but um, the conversation of like, yeah, we can totally do that, super short. Uh, so I rarely have a conversation that extends past, let's do it. Um, but on the other ones where it's like, hey, we probably need to consider, you know, the one that always comes up like, is this a barrier to entry? Because we've got, um, you know, Governor Abbott has sent a letter to all licensing <coughs> agencies about reducing barriers to entry. Um, that's not to say it's a no-go, but we, you know, I'm always going to be kind of bringing up the, the stuff that gets in the way of the big ideas. Um, and I don't do that because I don't like the ideas. I do that because I think I need to at this level. I don't want to have the relationship where, um, you know, Charles goes up to make a recommendation and for the first time ever in that meeting, I'm like, well, actually, you can't do any of that. Uh, there are six laws that prohibit that and you would be shutting down the entire industry. Uh, and so I try to be here as a resource for you in that regard. Um, but I don't want you to think that I'm trying to, to hold you back. Bring the ideas. I think the ideas are great. That's, that's what these groups are about. Um, and all ideas don't lead to the results that you think they will, but sometimes they lead to other results. Um, I'll always try and find a way. That's, that's kind of my thing. Um, but sometimes there is not a way on certain things. I mean, if you were like, hey, we have decided just the people in this room are going to hold licenses and no one else, right? That, that can't happen. Um, so I just, I want to explain a little bit about why we're in here. Um, we give staff reports. Uh, Mike's going to give some enforcement statistics. Mike uh, Malloy is our director of enforcement. He gets um, dragged into, I think, every single advisory committee meeting except for a lawyer, which he attends voluntarily. Uh, and uh, and he can really provide some good numbers, some good stats on like what we're seeing in enforcement. Uh, he can also collect numbers and see where the groups are headed. Okay, and then he's got a whole group of attorneys here too uh, that are paying attention and watching and they work on the education cases. Um, okay, so ESAC is established by rule. Um, to regularly review and revise curriculum standards, course content requirements, and instructor qualifications for qualifying and continuing education courses. So exciting stuff, right? Um, we get, I don't know, a lot of applications for this group. Um, I was going to say a million. I don't think it's quite a million. But every <laughs> time it opens up, it feels like a million. And that's cool. Um, it's really neat because people are interested and engaged, and they want to make a difference in this role, which is different than the role that you're serving um, outside when you're engaging in your own business practices. And so I think that's really neat. Um, this is your actual sort of charge. This is what you do. I think it's helpful to know um, in terms of what this group does. Gives you some structure. Um, so we've got seven license holders who've been engaged in the practice of real estate for at least five years prior to appointment and who are actively engaged in that practice. And so you provide, as license holders, the license holder perspective, right? Um, 
We've also got, because this group, this group is actually like pretty well structured. We've got one public who uh, represents the interests of the general public. Who's our public member? Rick Albers. <laughs> Um, and it's interesting because uh, what Rick has to do is probably different than what everyone else has to do to an extent because he has worn so many hats that he probably has a hat rack back there. Um, and so he is currently wearing his public member hat for ESAC. There you go. See, there it is. That's the hat. He can't wear it because he's got his headset on, but normally he'd be wearing that. Um, and so he provides, he has to think, okay, why am I here? What am I doing in my role on this group versus all the other groups. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow, Rick. Um, and so, you know, he's he's channeling that public member. He's looking out for the public. He's the consumer here. Um, and I think that's really helpful. We've also got four education members who are real estate instructors or owners of real estate schools accredited by TREC that provide qualifying or continuing education. That is super helpful because you know what's happening out there. Um, you are able to get messages out. You know what you're seeing in terms, you know, we get folks who are like, you would not believe what we're seeing out in the field. It's interesting. We also get that from you guys. Like, you would not believe the questions that we're getting. Um, you, you know, hey, I was looking at the legal one, legal two, and we've been getting this question and that question, and, and that's really helpful to us. Um, and you're here to provide that perspective um, as a member here. So I just talked about this a little bit, and I'm, this, don't worry, this training does not take up the entire meeting, uh, just goes too much. Uh, <laughs> so which hat do you wear when you come to a meeting? And where does consumer protection fit in when it comes to your recommendations? So when you have an idea or a thought or an agenda item you may want to put forward or question, um, are you being mindful that you're wearing your ESAC hat? and not your, is this good for my, you know, my own business hat? Is this something I personally want to see because it would benefit me? Um, if anyone in this room right now feels like I'm specifically calling them out, I am. Um, <laughs> and I see all of your guilty faces. No, um, I'm saying that because I think that it's, you've got to make that distinction. And that's hard sometimes because sometimes the thing that is good for the consumer is also good for what you're doing. And, the, and there's real value in that. Like, it's it it weaves in right but i will tell you you could always say we can do x y and z for consumer protection and okay well we can add that kind of anywhere we can make it fit um and so we want really the drive to do that consumer protection component um and that facilitating the economic growth component um and i'm giving you all a hard time because the minute anyone in any training is like and if you do this i'm immediately like it's me um i know it's me and but I, I think actually it's a good, like a little bit of a good moment to be like, oh yeah, no, wait, this is a little bit different. Um, what I'm doing here, this is my volunteer work. This is a little bit different. Okay, so here's where, um, I'll get a little bit into the dark stuff. So um, as a member of ESAC, you, you wear that hat of ESAC when you're in here. Um, you probably also wear it a little bit outside because people know who um, served on these committees you know that, you go and you talk at things, um, things like that. So you always want, especially I'll say in these meetings, but generally speaking, I think you want to um, remember this, that um, speaking in favor or against certain companies or businesses or individuals, um, that, uh, especially like the business practices, I think that comes up a lot um, because people have a lot of feelings on different business practices. And I get it, like someone's always coming up with something new, um, some other way of doing something. And um, and that way might be just fine, but it's a, it's a point of conversation, we hear it. Um, and so you want to really be mindful as a member of ESAC, especially in these meetings, um, of not speaking out against a specific practice or a group or an individual who's doing this thing. Um, if you've got something you need to talk about, the, probably one of the best ways to do it is to bring it to me and I can help formulate a discussion point that is not so specific. Um, and I think that's important because we don't want, we don't want perceived favoritism, right? Um, so like, 
I always use our chair's company because it's the one I remember. So, you know, Edge El Paso, I don't even the Edge. What I don't even know what it is. I'm just using his email address. Um, they are the best. There's no one better. Like everyone should be using them. Uh, they've never made a mistake in their entire lives. Um, and I'm saying that in this meeting. Like, that's problematic, right? I shouldn't be speaking to that in this meeting. I know nothing about how they do their business. Um, just to be very clear, I don't have that favoritism. Um, and, and that can create a loss of trust by both the consumer and the regulated industries. Um, and that can go both ways, right? So you could have perceived favoritism. You could also be like, wow, Kaleo really hates Edge El Paso. I mean, it is <laughs> bananas. Um, why is she so against them? And, um, and she has said some things in these meetings that have recorded and put on our website. And, um, the next thing we know, Kalei is being dragged into court, and I don't want that. Um, I can't help her then. Uh, Appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, You're on your I will be in my office <laughs> looking at the construction. Um, but I just want, you know, I want us to be mindful of that, and I think this group does a great job. Um, it's just, I think it's a good annual reminder of why we're here and what we do. Um, I mentioned this a little bit. So these are the things that um, I'm usually always talking about. So governor's letter, I say that because I feel like I'm the, you know, the rain cloud, the wet blanket of this group. Uh, governor's letter from 2019 asking licensees, licensing agencies like Trek to reduce barriers to entry. Um, if you don't have a copy of that letter, I'm happy to send it to you. Just ask me. Um, and we've also got the regulatory compliance division of the governor's office, and they take a look at our rules um, to make sure that we are not creating antitrust issues. Um, we're not increasing, you know, making access to the license harder um, without without reason, right? Like this is not just a, a blanket. You can never increase anything. You can never do anything. Um, but it, their set of eyes, we can't, um, if, if a rule does go to them, um, and they have to give us the okay before we can adopt that rule. And, and we've done that. Like we had some education requirements on, on the inspector side. We went back and forth with them and they're great. They're really helpful. Um, but that is a, a component. So I'll mention, you know, that may, if you're going to, if you want to move in that direction, that may go to regulatory compliance division which means, you know, we'll be looking at this and that and how does it, so I just want you to know that's what I'm talking about. Um, you can go on our website actually and look at some of the um, opinion, I don't want to call them an opinion letter, but the letters that they put out um, and see what changes other groups are looking at if you're interested in that kind of thing. Um, and that's, that I think is helpful. And then I'll always speak to, and, and so will Abby, um, who can, you know, quote any rule at any moment um, or statute. The set, I'm, I'm saying that very loudly. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, she's a great resource for us in this regard. The statutory restraints and whether something would require rulemaking. Um, and what is rulemaking versus statute? And well, you know, we, I think we've had those discussions here. Um, if anybody has any questions, we can always dig into that. Um, we do have restraints in statute, which is a good thing because you don't want the government to be totally unfettered. Uh, we have rulemaking authority, which is helpful for our license holders because it kind of narrows it. It gives you something to look to, um, sort of your boundaries, things like that. Okay. And you, we don't have to answer all these questions, but these are the ones that I thought were helpful. And especially since we have um, new members, we have members that are, um, that have been here for a bit. Um, the ones that are kind of, we've gotten some reappointments, so I thought it might be helpful, and I'll just kind of, um, I'm going to law school it here and just call on people at random, um, which is my worst nightmare, uh, but now I get to do it to others. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I'll say, um, let's see, Byron, why did you choose to serve on ESAC? Is it the cookies? Yeah, it is. The yeah. Cookies. Yeah, yeah. And the coffee. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Truthfully? Yeah, truthfully. Okay. Well, um, no. no, 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 no. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, let's open it Sorry. up a little bit for discussion. I think this is helpful um, for new folks. It also gets us kind of going a little bit with new, you know, we've got new folks. We're getting it together. So why did you choose to serve on ESAC? Well, as, a, as an educator, mm -hmm. it gives me the opportunity to uh, uh, work more closely with the public 
to make sure that they're getting what they deserve through real estate education and from brokers and sales agents. And so I thought this is a place where I could I could participate in that. Cool. Is there a license holder member who has an answer to that question? I can't remember who serves and what. Bill? So I want to see us improve the confidence and the competency of the members who practice real estate. Uh, I think it's great, but I think it can always be improved upon and sometimes maybe the things we put out there aren't practical in helping them serve the public. Oh, that's great. Um, I think the uh, real world application versus, you know, what what happens in terms of like rule drafting and agencies, sometimes they can get separate. And so it's really helpful to have sort of the boots on the ground and know what's going on out there um, so that we're not just kind of up here making rules and not knowing what's actually happening out there. <coughs> um, okay, so Kalea, is your understanding of how, it says the ESAC, but that's because I improved it, how ESAC works different now than it was when you started? So I think this is my fifth year, and um, I really appreciate that ESAC has, in my opinion, become a little more progressive with this understanding and thinking, especially through the pandemic and the, the changes that happened to education, like overnight. Um, and so I think that it has, it's not that it's working different, but I think that we just have a different understanding of what can be. And the innovation that comes with education delivery methods and um, you know how we um, I guess digest information is different now and so I think the one of the reasons that I enjoy this committee so much is because we can grapple with all of those different nuances that we're experiencing now and then make make changes for the betterment of the consumer moving forward and I agree with you with the license holder as well that's great. And I think, you know, as we're looking at, um, this is our first meeting of the year, looking at what this group wants to accomplish this year um, and, and what they want to look at, some of which we'll ask. We're going to talk about some opening up an outline later today, but what does this group want to look at this year? Because um, you spent a good part of this last year looking at broker-agent relationship. Um, you've made some strong changes, recommendations. Um, so we'll we'll kind of start working on that too, which I think is helpful. So think about that um, as we move forward. And then um, I, Candy, how has serving on an advisory committee as an advisory committee member changed your perspective on Trek? She clearly. Oh, she threw me. Well, oh yeah, she yeah. Clearly, yeah. 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 yeah, that's right. Oh, oh, this is gonna go good. Okay, first off, sorry. Yes. First off, when have you ever been in a class other than with me exactly. that there's another Candy? <laughs> um, I think that it has it's, it hasn't changed it's reinforced that you guys are the good guys yeah. okay um, and I have brought that up and I pointed to our top person that, that we have made some changes in track and we have a little bit more grace we don't terrify people so quite so much and being on ESAC, I actually feel like we have the opportunity to make changes or do things that are going to reflect on Trek and make make everybody a little bit more comfortable with us. Okay. Yeah, cool. Mike, did you have something? I always could. Yeah, go for it. Uh, <laughs> I would piggyback that you know, from the educator, from running a school point of view, working with uh, the staff from education, Jennifer and her team, it would seem quite difficult many times. Um, but getting to serve on the committee, um, understanding uh, how all that works is really helped out quite a bit. Cool. So That's great. They're, they're uh, vastly underrated um, from what the rest of the profession understands. That's awesome. Um, okay, best advice for new members. Does anybody have any? Get involved. Absolutely. Don't just sit here. Yeah. Voice your opinions. <laughs> okay. Ask questions. Cool. Yeah. And you can always reach out to us if you have questions too in the interim, um, or ideas or thoughts, and we'll help 
will help get them where they need to go in terms of do you know do we want to get this to the chair for a possible agenda item um, to think about if you just have a, a random question you need to ask about something they've been looking at please feel free to reach out to me um, okay that is my last slide and I think I don't talk again for the rest of the meeting. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, is that a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> okay. We'll find out. Thanks, Vanessa. That was great. Thank um, you. All right. We don't need to read the minutes unless we want to. Do we have any um, changes in the minutes? Can we? Unless there's no change, we'll move forward. Okay. Is that all right? All right. Here we go. Election of officers. Um, so what we're going to do it. We will call for nominations. Uh, they don't need to be seconded. And then once we'll, we'll vote in order of the way they were nominated, we'll go through presiding officer, chair, assistant presiding officer, vice chair, and secretary. Uh, so I guess the easy way to do this is open up nominations for presiding officer or chair. I would like to nominate Candy Cook for chair and Bill Seven for vice chair. We'll what? do. We'll do some <laughs> chair first. New chair. Hi. Okay. I'd like to uh, renominate you for uh, presiding officer. Okay. Thanks. Others? Who else? Nominations closed, I guess. Uh, yeah. The way we do it. We'll do it in the order. All right. Do we do it uh, the way we, we normally raise our hands? Do that. We just make sure we can count. Do that. Make sure we get our, our virtual voting members. Got my eyes on you. So you'll do a hand raise. So for but you can just actually raise your hands because I'm watching you. <laughs> we'll go for candy first and we'll raise our hands and there are 12 of us that vote, right? So, yeah, so for a majority, we need seven. And once we have a majority, that's it. We don't continue to. Perfect. Okay. Well, all for Candy Cook, raise your hand. <laughs> She's sleeping. Okay, just type one, two, three, four, five, six, just six. Okay, six. So we'll go on to Charles. All for Charles Porter. <laughs> We have a tie. <laughs> <laughs> now what do we do? Not say this I'm right. <laughs> well, I think we have to keep going until we have a majority for someone. So. Just like uh, yeah, we did the house speaker. <laughs> <We're just laughs> <that's laughs> <that's laughs> oh, oh, Seven for Kevin. Say a little something about their experience or their background. Or up to you. You want to do that? You want to say backgrounds or do we just do we want to? I, do have some I don't know if everybody, I, they may not know us. Sure, go ahead. Kate. Okay. Um, I am entering my 40th year of real estate in Texas. I'm only, I'm, I was only 10 when I started. Um, I am a broker and an appraiser and senior instructor um, and um, actually halfway through a doctorate in adult education. My passion is just to do this, just to get it out there, get us going. Okay. I uh, have been licensed since 77. Um, I uh, have a PhD in economics and business. I taught for many years at St. Edwards University after being a broker for a long time. Grew up in Austin, uh, developed property in Houston all through the 80s around River Oaks and West University Place and, and Tanglewood survived the bank wars without bankruptcy when all the banks failed. Came back home and uh, became very active as a real estate broker. In the process, I ended up doing a bunch of other things, a lot of expert witness work. Uh, I've not done as much as Mr. Jacobus, but I've been over 700 cases in the last uh, 40, 30 years or something. I write books about water rights uh, and occasionally write articles in the Texas Realtor Magazine about a variety of things. Uh, I'm a co-author of the Legal Ethics 1 and 2 manuals and the Broker Responsibility Manual. Past chairman of the Austin Board of Realtors. Uh, uh, my wife fusses at me. I'm on the board of directors and associate realtors and other places. So, My whole goal has always been to better educate our license holders so they can better serve the public. That's what we 
started years ago at the Austin Board of Realtors, kind of our theme. And I think it's absolutely incredible <coughs> right now. So that's me. Okay. So I think we'll just restart the voting again. So we'll go with Candy so she was first nominated. Um, so all in favor of Candy as chair, you can raise your hand. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right, Candy, you're Candy, there. Candy, you're good. Very good. Congratulations. <laughs> okay, does Candy continue on? Do I take over or does So he... it kind of depends on what your comfort level is um, after this for sure, but if you want to take over now, you're welcome to. You can finish up the, the voting. <laughs> when I did it, we okay. finished that. The, New officers, yeah. and then we took over. All right. Yeah. Well, now nominees for the assistant presiding officer or vice chair. I'd like to nominate Bill Stedham. <laughs> <laughs> Bill Stedham. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Anybody else? Other nominees? Look at the eyes. <laughs> Are you all right with that? I'm fine with that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Don't see anyone else. Okay. It's Bill Stedham. Yep. Yeah. Secretary, nominees for secretary. Anybody? Someone? My crowning. I other? nominate. <laughs> All right, my crowning. Any other nominations? My crowning. Very good. Yeah. Okay. Can I get out my knitting now? <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So our next one is number seven is public or written. Oh, thank you, everybody. I don't know if it's a thank you or, oh my gosh, what did I do this time? Okay. Um, number seven is public or written comments received on non-agenda items. Uh, our, we have received one written comment. Um, if anyone would like to further discuss this issue, they can recommend this be included on a future agenda. Um, you can ask Vanessa or Abby if we've received anything else. Oh, I guess that's saying, have we received it? <laughs> I'll, I'll get this red before it's, it's I get it. it. Yeah. <laughs> it's like hand it to me and it doesn't even come okay. Do we have any other comments? Is it just Mr. Brown's comment? Right, and I think everybody received an email. Um, and, and so to the extent this group wants to discuss this item, um, we can figure out how to include that on the agenda for the next meeting. Um, so this would really be like, is this something you want to talk about in April? Can I can I ask a qualified <coughs> question on this? Um, is it up to us as to who's on our committee, or is it that's up? My that's yeah. my question. Is we don't appoint? Um, should this be forwarded on to the powers that that do select who's going to be on this committee? Is that where we go with this? My uh, my understanding is that that we're we are the creation by rule by the commission, and we make recommendations to the commission. So I think what we're being asked by Mr. Brown is for us to make a recommendation to the commission that um, as to what he wants. What what he wants is somebody from a college. To be on the board on on ESAC. Um, that's what I understand you to be asking. Okay. May I? Yes. Mike. The uh, isn't this already? I mean, we, we already have folks from colleges that serve on ESAC. But I don't understand how this would be any different than what the current criteria already is. So it seems like um, if Mr. Brown or, or a like person would to apply for ESAC like anyone else, that they would be considered like anyone else. So it almost appears to be a mute. Hey, um, one other question on this, because I, I my questions before I was chairman. Um, 
what did we change that he was upset about having to fill out? Do we know? I don't think we changed anything. I think he woke up to the fact that he had to submit a class for approval and didn't like it. Okay. But maybe uh, Abby might be able to shed a little more light on it. I don't know. I think that's right. I agree with my sentiment. Yeah. And I also agree he, if, he do, if he's in the pool that can apply, there's no question about that. I don't know that we should be carving out uh, within the pool of providers uh, a special type of provider. So I would vote to not put it on the next agenda. Everybody agrees? Absolutely. Okay. We're going to go. Go on. Does will someone respond to him? Because he asked yes. about five different times. I will, I will respond. He and I have been going back and forth. I do have a question on just if it ever comes up again when a member that wants to talk to us or the public wants to talk to us about something and then they send an email with a video. How does that work out? Should we? What should we do? Should we be watching that, paying attention to that? Um, I will tell you, I've never seen that before. That was an exciting first um, <laughs> that I did not anticipate. So I would say, um, you know, we talked about this earlier today. I think what we would have done is since this was an item that was just going to be a public comment and ultimately a recommendation, we would have worked with him to make that a material. Generally speaking, I think if somebody sends you all something, um, I will typically respond to you and say, hey, we'll take care of this. Um, we'll either get it on the agenda or we'll, we'll work through that. Um, because what you saw there is he sent it to everybody and I was very happy no one replied all, um, no one weighed in, um, and we get that. So to the extent, I mean, I was on there so I, I had it and I could do something with it. Um, but the, you know, the actual video testimony that was an interesting one I've not seen before um, because it came beforehand. So you were not under an obligation to watch that and weigh in. It wasn't yet a part of your materials. I think what we would have done is figured out how to get that in there for the next meeting if it had moved forward. Okay. It's not like a walking quorum issue or anything because you're not responding to each other. You're just right. receiving information right. and thinking about it similar to a comment. Right. Okay. Um, and, and no one weighed in. And so that's that's good. Um, and so, so it was handled right. It kind of came at the, I just was not expecting it to be totally frank. It came in kind of last minute. Um, but we talked about that this morning. All right, so we are not going to forward it. Okay. And I will circle back with Mr. Brown. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, number eight is our staff report on education enforcement matters. And Mr. Malloy gets to talk to us again. Good morning, everyone. So the report that you see there, I know there's some new members, so I'm just going to walk through a few things. Uh, uh, this report's unique where you guys requested it several years ago. I haven't changed anything, so. If you have any other questions about this, you can always reach out to me. I do have a suggested change going forward. Uh, similarly, we do a report like this for the inspectors. We actually link the agreed order to the report. And some of the inspectors like it, and other people like it because they can just click on the link and see the orders. These, you all don't receive the orders directly when we finalize them. Only the commissioners receive those as part of our policies and stuff. So at least in the minimum, you'd be able to see the orders and the facts associated with some of those orders. Mm -hmm. You can always go and search them up by the, the case numbers that's on there. Like it just, it's right. just an extra convenient step. I can put that in there if you prefer. I, like I would it. appreciate it if you put that link in. Okay, mm -hmm. I'll do yeah. that going forward. In this case, we had three advisor letters and two uh, formal disciplinary actions. But the new members' advisor letters are basically uh, what they are, kind of advisory letters. They're informal disciplinary actions. Um, they're maybe touch on a little bit of evidence that they may have violated the License Act, but it wasn't to the fact that uh, serious enough we felt that formal disciplinary action was necessary. So we advised them of what they need to do for, you know, uh, 
in the situation. And it does remain a part of their record for up to 10 years and can be used going forward if they have similar disciplinary action in the future. Okay, any questions? All right, number nine, discussion of possible action regarding changes to the qualifying course outline for residential property management. Do you want me to take this? I'd love that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I kind of figured. Um, so at the last committee meeting, we reviewed, the committee reviewed the existing property management course outline. Um, there were a lot of recommendations, including one most significantly to change the title of the course, which then kind of um, leads into the changes to the content. And so to specify this as a residential property management course. And so we've done that, and basically what I did, I tried, this is kind of an informal format. It's not formatted like the, the true course approval form, but it makes it easier for me to work on if you have any changes. Um, I took into consideration, um, you know, listening to the meeting again, and the notes that I took from, from that conversation, there were some notes that were provided by some of the members that were emailed, and so I took those into consideration. Um, and then, you know, just everything that I heard from, from the discussion at the last meeting. And I tried to create this <laughs> in accordance with, you know, with your recommendations. Um, so this is the first draft. I'm bringing this back to you to, um, you know, hopefully you've had a chance to look at it. I modified the minutes that were associated with each uh, topic or unit. Um, kind of based on the feelings and the information that I got from you guys. So here it is for you. Um, I'm happy to take any constructive feedback. Um, is there anybody who had a chance to look at that, that had any like significant comments that we could? I think it looks really good. Yeah, I think it's very complete. Do you, I, I yeah. really had hoped to capture everything, but if there are things that I missed, I, I really want to know. Yeah. what those might be. Any comments? That goes right way to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if there are no changes, that we can recommend that this be proposed by the commission at its February meeting. Do we need a, a motion for that? Okay, second? Second. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, wait, we have to read her name. Let me give my bifocals in run. But Rick got Rick Beach and Cassie. I'm sorry. No, I'll we'll get you the next time. Okay. All in Bill. Bill. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Do it. Okay. We got that. Yeah. Well, well, that went a lot easier than I was thinking it might. Is that an opinion I put out there? It is. Okay, number 10 is a discussion of possible action on 22 TAC 535.55 education and sponsorship requirements for sales agent license and 22 TAC 535.56 education experience requirements for a broker's license. Abby is up. I am up. Um, so if you recall, <clears throat> Excuse me. At the October meeting, um, you all had a discussion and requested that staff come back with a draft uh, to essentially require that the real estate brokerage course be incorporated as part of the additional 90 hours for a sales agent, part of that SAV. Um, and so what you see before you in 535.55 is a pretty simple uh, amendment um, to, in, to capture that. <clears throat> There is one additional issue we wanted to bring up, which was uh, 535.56, and you can see some highlighted language there. And I don't, this may have been discussed at the last meeting, I don't recall it, <clears throat> but essentially what that highlighted language means, which actually comes from statute as well in 535.56, what that will mean is that for most license holders, now there will be a little bit of a lag time once this goes into effect where there will be some broker applicants who weren't subject to this rule, but for most license holders, this will require them to take real estate brokerage twice. 
Um, so I wanted to make sure that you were aware of that. That may be no big deal, that may be fine, but I just wanted to make sure we vetted that and had that conversation. <clears throat> I'm confused. Yes. Um, so we're saying that they would include the 30 hour qualifying education brokerage course as part of their SAE. Mm -hmm. Why would they have taken it? Have, why? Why twice? Because of the timing. So this requires uh, you. Yeah. So, so this requires you well, to take it two years before you, when you're applying for a broker's license, and you've got to have, you know, the four out of the, all that four out of the five years active experience. So they would have to take it again. So yeah. most there is. I was actually talking to Denise Sample, our director of licensing. There is like a one scenario kind of rare where that might not be the case, but for most license holders, it's going to be, um, of course, taken twice. Isn't there also a rule that you can't take a course within a two year, the same course within a two year period? Does that have an effect as well? Um, in the same renewal. Um, now, we're looking at if 90, within the first two years, right, and then they have four years, so they should be out of that period. Right. Um, to qualify for a broker's license, you have to have four consecutive four years, years four right, before you can apply, months. right? Right. right. Mm -hmm. There's no way to double up on that to get that. Well, it's, it might be possible. I'm wondering, though, if if maybe that if we're talking about the consumer, somebody getting their broker's license, if the last time they took that class could have been two years ago, is that information relevant enough being two years old and applying for a broker's license, whereas making it one year from applying to your broker's license, or is that asking too much from the person that's a broker applicant? That'd be kind of annoying. Yeah. Well, and just to clarify, that, that highlighted language comes from statute. Um, so there actually are, there may be some changes this session to that particular statutory section. We don't anticipate any changes to that particular requirement, but we don't really have any flexibility to change that highlighted part now. Um, so again, you're looking at, I think, majority of applicants, once this goes into effect, this would be a, a course they would be taking twice. Right. Yes, but it's twice. Uh, but on, you're, you're, I think you're thinking about somebody going straight through and getting their broker's license in the shortest amount of time possible. And I don't know how many people do that, but I think it's a very small fraction. But even then, I don't see any, you got if you're sponsoring somebody already, you got to take it every two years. So I don't see any problem with somebody on a fast track having to do the same thing that a, a practicing broker has to do already. Yeah, so this does get confusing because the courses are similarly yeah. named, um, but real estate, bro so the broker responsibility course, that's the every two year course. Um, real estate brokerage is the, the longer 30 hour qualifying course um, that doesn't require retaking it. So if we wanted to not run up against this, what is the recommended change I'm not sure there is a recommended change. It would be just to not move forward with this. It's it's okay. I spend the hours coaching people on getting their broker's license. This is this taking that class within two years of taking your exam. You can't even schedule the exam until you're past the four years. So they should be out of that renewal, as Mike said. Um, you can't take the same class within the renewal, right? So you're already out of that. One. And then by the time you apply, you're already out of the four-year requirement or a five-year requirement. You have to be out of it. Right. So you have to take it twice, but not twice within the same period. So it's not like... Just, it wouldn't be... Just to I don't think it would be a duplicate. Right. And I understand that's, that's where you're going yeah. with this, is yeah. not getting credit because of the duplicate um, right. rule. But I do feel like, and I wish I could remember, the actual thought process I had when we first looked at this, but um, when when Abby and Vanessa drafted this, I, I looked at it with that in mind, and I remember coming to the conclusion <laughs> that it would not be impactful, like because of like what Mike was saying. Right. You've got their first two-year period; they'll be outside of that period. Yeah. I don't think there's. Our ultimate, our ultimate objective in making this recommendation is to protect the public. Oh, okay. 
and to get agents to know who they're responsible to, correct? Well, and in a way, it's serving two purposes, I think, because right. the initial purpose is as it relates to that first two year terms of licensure. Mm -hmm. And with the changes that you all made to the course content, it's really picking up on, you know, understanding expectations and, and responsibilities. And then can lend itself, you know, the other way when it comes time for that same individual after at least four years of practicing as a sales agent or sure. enter into the, you know, know what they're new, have a better, you know, because you're coming at it from a different perspective each time, I think. And so I, that makes the benefit is, is still there on that. You have different levels of, uh, of knowledge and experience in the rooms, depending exactly. on is it a, a 30 hour SAE class versus it, are we talking to broker candidates here who may be taking the, the, the same class within the same month? I mean, they really could. Right. Uh, however, as an educator, when you sit there and look at the people in the room, even though the content has its specific objectives, you have ringers in there who can bring value into that's not meant to be rude. Uh, those 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 professionals who bring value into the discussion and right. so each each class has its own its own dance depending on who's in the room with you and and having uh, uh, someone in their first renewal go through and look at the objectives of what that relationship is and then what the responsibility is of the broker and then taking it to that different level with the broker candidates and say, how would you address these issues? I think they are, even though it may be the same course, they have a different level of value depending on who, who's the receiver of it. I agree with that. Yeah, that's it. Okay, are we saying we're going to stay with the proposed verbiage? Can I have a motion? So move. So move. Oh. oh. <laughs> That's a crying Try it again. Yes. One of these times I'm going to get you in. Okay, all in favor? Who was the second? It was Mike. Oh, oh my. I tried to put my hand over his mouth like in the house the other night. It didn't work. But he's willing to remove his second. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, any opposed? So this will be taught. Did you get the, I'm sorry. What? Did you get the, did we get the vote for approved? Everybody. Mm -hmm. Oh, everyone. Okay. <laughs> I was taking notes. Sorry. <laughs> Abby, you were being meticulous. <laughs> okay. Number 11, update regarding pass rate data uh, for two, four, and six years as it relates to course completion dates. Jen? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Chair. Um, I sent something to Amber and asked if she could uh, share it on the screen. This was not included in your materials, but is a summary of, um, of the newest information request. I will just as a reminder or um, for those who are new to this meeting, at the last committee meeting, um, the committee asked staff to provide data for applicants whose first attempt at the sales agent license exam occurred what we brought is over a two-year period, and that information was from 9-1 of 2020 through 8-31 of 2022. The data indicated that of the sales agents who passed the exam on the first attempt, so keep in mind, this is, I'm, I'm refreshing you on what we presented last time. Um, so the data indicated that of the sales agents who passed the exam on the first attempt, about 94, just over 94% of those completed all of their coursework um, within two, two years, years of taking the exam for the first time. Um, similarly, of the sales agents who failed the exam for the first time during that two year period, 93% of their education was completed within two years of taking the exam. Um, so as a result of the discussion at the last meeting, the ask from staff was to provide you with information um, in two year increments. And so that's what I have up, what Amber has up on the screen and you should be able to see um, if you're logged into the meeting. But um, so basically we went back two, four and six years at your request. Um, I've got my subject matter expert here, Rebecca. 
um, also <laughs> for, for any questions. Um, but of the sales agents who passed the exam on the first of the tenth, the first attempt, recency, of course, completion certificates. I've got to get up because I can't see that. Even with my glasses on, I can't see that. So, um, oh, thanks, Amber. So we're we're at that, you know, ninety four percent. Um, for less than two years before taking uh, the exam for the first time. 4% um, for two to four years, less than 1%. I mean, you see how we've dropped ever so significantly um, in these other categories. Um, and then again, presenting same kind of stats, but for those who failed the first attempt, um, we've got 90% almost up here. And then we dropped significantly only 7.46% took courses two to four years before take at least one course two to four years before taking the exam. So keep in mind this isn't a cumulative. This is like if you took one or more older than. Um, what we have discovered um, now we don't have the stats to present to you here, but one of the um, kind of consistencies or discoveries we made is that oftentimes here these are individuals who have completed college coursework or a real estate degree way back when. And, you know, so they've only done a few courses currently because like attorneys, you know, they basically they've already got law agents and law agency and contract law just out of the nature of their degree program. Um, so that's where we see a little bit of an impact here. So at to Rick's question to Rick's la question last time, um, all of the data we provided to you last time was specific to uh, proprietary schools. This information does include colleges and universities. Um, the work that it would take to exclude those on this large of a scale was really significant and their impact is fairly minimal, as you can see. So um, I just want to make sure you're clear on what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like I need to stand up anymore. I just wanted to be able to walk through that with you. Um, so even going back, looking at these, you know, further increments, um, the data still seems to to to, um, to reflect that there is not necessarily a significant impact on the recency of the coursework. Um, that said, um, in this conversation, if you, if you want to continue to have this conversation, I want to be really careful to distinguish between college and university courses versus those that are taken, the courses that are taken from a, a real estate proprietary provider. Um, I would caution you against putting any kind of barrier or expiration on something that somebody took at a college or university. I feel like that's, you know, so that's an aspect of the conversation that we haven't had that in the past meetings. So I just want to make sure to highlight that. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. Rebecca is here to answer questions. And if you all just want to pick up the conversation where you left off, we can do that. Anybody have anything? So I, I, I'm, I'm trying to get my head around that. It, it says it's not that big of a deal when they took it. Maybe I'm just stupid. Um, <laughs> don't vote on that. My <laughs> <laughs> Of those who passed on the first attempt, 94% of them took their classes in the last two years. Took a class in the last two years. Took a class. So would the... the, the uh, so all of their classes. All of the classes? Yes. Okay. Within yes. the last two years. So would the statistics or the analytics look any different if the question were different? Of, of those who took their classes in the last two years, what percentage of them passed on their first attempt? Does that change or am I looking at it wrong? I, is that what, uh, Rebecca, isn't that what we provided at the last meeting? 
No, he's asking us to combine the data into a single thing. I can't do the math in my head on the spot. I okay. can get that for you for the next meeting, but I can't yeah. do that in the okay. spot. I don't think it would change, but I don't hold me to that. Does that make sense, what I'm asking? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and then what about if it were four? Well, it'll be the same question. Right. Right. You're just yeah. asking me it's to combine yeah. um, I just don't want to try and do some calculations. On Absolutely. The yeah, I wouldn't ask <laughs> you to do that. So we can add that to the agenda next time? what we'd like to do. Okay, so do, do we need to get that statement Can you clarified? state it one more time? I don't so think so. <laughs> <laughs> um, of those who took their classes in the last two years. Two years before the exam. So they yes, took the exam within the last two years, and their courses were up to two years before that. That's, That's right. What we have. Okay, yes. that first group. What is the first time pass? What is the <coughs> pass rate? So what's the percentage of those? Yeah. Okay. And then four years and six years. Sure. Because I think that, in my opinion, that's looking more at what we're asking. Yeah, so it sounds like you want us to condense those two tables into one. Uh -huh. In this category, who, what percentage pass, what percentage fail. Yeah. We can do that. And we get more time to look at these numbers as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now keep in mind, you're still going to have the university data mixed in with the qualifying provider. Sure. As it should, I believe. Yeah. That's yeah. something that wasn't really considered. And, yeah. You know, if somebody... I uh, paid quite a deal of money for a university class. Um, you'd want that included. Yeah. Sure, and and of course I completely agree with that. Um, like I said, I don't want to get in the business of right. <laughs> regulating colleges. I mean, we couldn't. That's a word, right. but that's the way we go. Yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's a good point. Sure, but. Um, but keep in mind that, that I think the original perspective was in terms of exam pass rates and performance of the education provider in that regard, where we don't we don't regulate the college and university in that way. Right. Okay. So, um, and I'll I'll just well I'll leave it at that. We'll see what we bring back to you next ne next time. May I just ask a refresher on what our end game is with this exercise? I know Mike, you have presented. Last time, some concerns. So, can we just like get a range on what our end game is so that we're not going down a trip to Adelaide and everything? Sure. Help me, help me remember what we were talking about. One of the initial um, the initial question was is the amount of time taken to pass their exams reflecting the pass rate leading to should there be an expiration on course certificates? Got it. There was a comment on this, right? Didn't we see a comment? From their yeah. oh, like Julie. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. For a recommendation of of uh, looking specifically at um, two courses, isn't that right, Julie? Thank you for that. Yeah, I just was. Um, I had looked back. Uh, we had talked about other states, other people, and what what those were, and I did find that. So. But and so I was just curious if we looked back a little further. Yeah, scroll down on that, would you please, on her? Right. Your recommendation was to look specifically at the law of contracts and promulgated forms. <laughs> yeah, basically because I I feel like as an agent, I mean as as someone that's in the in the trenches, if they haven't taken those courses for a really long time then they're missing out on a lot of changes that may have made. Yes. That one, we put the three hours of contracts in every two years. Say that out loud. I, I, I was I'm just saying it in my brain. That's why we put in the requirement for three hours of contracts every two years every two for years. everybody. Well, but not as a new, they don't have to do it until they're after the first renewal. renewal. So yes. that could be four almost four years later. Oh, all right. Do we want to do something with this? Do we want to? We're bringing back the 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 numbers in the next meeting. Okay. Do we want to cons add that to the agenda that we consider this um, and bring in the factor of law of contracts and propagated contracts? as a part of that conversation. Anybody? 
May I add something? <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, I like the way she goes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm just, I'm just being, <laughs> just being um, An alternative proposal for, for you guys to consider, which is not on the agenda, so why don't you would maybe need to put it on the next agenda. But we're talking about the, uh, you know, setting expiration limits on certificates or course completion dates. An alternative thought might be, so something might be brought up uh, maybe a year ago, um, was that currently we accept um, principals for all of the qualifying courses uh, if they were approved at the time that they were offered or completed. Um, starting in 2014 and over the next several years is when this committee in its form then made recommendations and changed all the qualifying course content to be very specific. So an alternative thought might be to require those courses to be completed, like the, the revised courses, as opposed to the old courses. Mm. So that would effectively eliminate if I took law of agency in 2003, it was approved then, but it's, it's not, not the current system. version. You know, the current version has been out for a period that of time. But does that exclude the colleges and universities? We would, not, we would touh colleges right. and universities. Right. It would just be we don't easy. already, so that's not. Right. Right. Yeah. So, and so essentially it would be um, courses submitted for licensing purposes must be the approved course. According to the, the revised content. content. According to the revised content. Beginning in 2014. Now, but I don't think we can't really talk about it, right? I think we would want to put that on the agenda for the next one. Yes. Yes. People kind of think about it. Yeah. Is worth considering. Yeah. There's something in there that's making me say, what happens if they're using those courses to get their broker's license? Are we going to go make, make well, them go back and take those classes that they took back for the for the all the additional hours? It would actually help so. them. I would, yeah. It wouldn't hurt. It wouldn't hurt. It would but it's something to think. It, okay. It could be a puzzle benefit. I would like to propose we add that to the next agenda. Right. Okay. Um, we are on number 12, which is regarding uh, agenda items for next meeting. I have the numbers coming back on pass rates. I have the required courses that have been revised. Is there anything else we want to add? Did we so, ever answer the question on why we're going down the pass rate question? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Just want to make sure. I wasn't sure I understood it. Okay. So I want to speak to the agenda item, the proposed agenda item for the next meeting, which is additional revised courses. It's kind of similar content. Um, Vanessa and Abby and I had talked about what might be next for this group. You guys have made, you have done the revisions to real estate brokerage. We've done the work for property management, but it is also, as you saw in Vanessa's presentation, the purview of the group to continue to monitor and make recommendations regarding curriculum standards and content. So if you feel like it would be a worthy venture, it might be time. As I mentioned, we started revising those the course content back in 2014. If we want to bring back principles one and two as a starting point to take a look at those outlines and see if any recommendations can be made, um, we can we can start that process again. I think it's important for us to or for you all to regularly look at those. You know, at least every five or six years or so, just to continue to make sure that they are relevant in what the industry is today. I definitely, I, I, I definitely agree. Okay. I think it'll solve some of the problems we're experiencing also that would better help. Well, I feel like we know, I mean, as a group, as, you know, as an agency, as members of the committee, we just have learned so much on this journey of, you know, bringing ESAC back and since I think our first meeting was in 2013 um, of this iteration. So I feel like, you know, there's more good work that can be done. Okay. All right. Any other agenda items? Number 13, future meeting dates. We have proposed April 3rd with alternates of 4th and 5th. Well, one correction, Wednesday's the 5th and Thursday's the 6th. I think so. 
unless we skip Tuesday and April. <laughs> My calendar is numbered the same way. <laughs> That's so we have a day off. Okay. <laughs> so third, third. When is Easter? And that that is the week prior to Easter, if that changes anybody's plans. Easter is the Sunday following the dates we're talking about. The ninth is Easter. Correct. Third's good. Yes. Okay, third's good. Now, can I bring up what? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I I was going to say this group has. Um, has been in the the practice of calendaring the year. Year, yes, and, and it I, seems I, to help if you yes. want to if you want to do that. Yes. yes. If you had let me say one more word, I would have said. I'm I sorry. Said, Let's I'm take so sorry. <laughs> yes. What a great idea. <laughs> Thank you, Vanessa. Um, so the third. The third. We're doing. Are we third? Are we third? <laughs> That's so that I remember you're here. It's only my husband. It's only the Okay. Um, <laughs> July. We end up with 4th of July playing games with us, I believe. Right, and that's third Tuesday the 4th. Right. Of course, it's the 4th. It's two, It's a Tuesday, and <laughs> Monday is the 3rd. Do we, Jeez. I believe we've moved it into the next week previously. Suggest that's my memory, yeah. Does the tent work, or does it bounce into another meeting? Works for me. Works. Yeah, ready, It works for me. I'll be back for a vacation. <laughs> okay, what do we have for October? It's the second. It's a second. Okay, that's fine. Works. Okay, that takes care of the whole whole year. Do you want to do January or no? Well, that'll be a different. I guess it's a different. Year. That's not me. Okay. It probably will be calendar though. Yeah. Unless you make me come back. It will It'll be, be a different committee. Yeah, I'll be here briefly. But we'll still need a date, right? But you'll still need a date. How about one eight? Mm -hmm. No, still need a date. Yeah. We'll be more tentative with that, but let's. Okay. Is that everything that we needed to do? Okay. Do I have a motion for adjournment? Hang on, hang on, hang on. No. <laughs> no, I'm not going to do the motion. I just want to make a comment. I wanted to um, uh, recognize Mr. Porter for his oh, great job yes. here. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Okay. We're all trying. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Any second. All in favor? We can go on. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. We're trying to help.